Good day, welcome to our second part of uh, our lecture on uh, uh, the prevention of uh, HIV associated opportunistic infections. And as I indicated during uh, uh, the first part of this uh, lecture, I said that uh, um, in the second part, we will mainly discuss uh, issues around the interaction between uh, HIV infection and HSV, that is uh, herpes simplex uh, virus, especially type two, that uh, we are going to, to discuss uh, in uh, this presentation and how do we prevent that from uh, occurring. So uh, we will look at uh, HIV and uh, herpes simplex virus uh, type two. So we will discuss the intersecting epidemics. Uh, so among the two infections, I am uh, Dr. Teke Apalata. I am a specialist in uh, clinical microbiology. So what can you expect from uh, this uh, uh, presentation? The first thing is that we will uh, look at uh, HSV2 and HIV interactions and crosstalk among the two infections. And we will specifically look at the pathogenesis of uh, HSV2 in HIV infected people. And then we will then look at the management and prevention of uh, HSV2 infection in HIV infected persons. So let's look at the interaction now. There is a, a relationship, a strong relationship between the two infection between HSV and herpes simplex virus type two. So they affect each other. Now, uh, let's look at uh, the effect of uh, HSV2 on HIV. What is it that HSV2 does to HIV? You know, HSV2 is known to increase HIV acquisition. And we will see how it does that, how HSV2 increase HIV acquisition. It's actually through the increase of the genital tract inflammation because when you have, this is a genital infection. So when you develop this infection that is HSV2, you know, there will be a local inflammation. So uh, the infection, the presence of the infection, HSV, HSV2 infection will attract, you know, uh, inflammatory cells at the site of infection. And because of that inflammation, it then gives a way for HIV acquisition because some of the inflammatory cells uh, carry what we call uh, CD4 receptors. They carry receptors for HIV. So it will then give a way, you know, for, for HIV to, to go through. Or HSV also does remember that it gives you, beside the vesicles on the skin, it also gives you blisters or small ulceratic uh, lesions, and that allow HIV to go through. So HSV then increases the acquisition of uh, HIV. And the other thing is also that it will decrease the antiviral immunity because uh, there is a uh, the epithelium integrity is compromised, so there is a, a reduction in uh, on the layer of uh, on the protective layer of the body. So the immune system, at least the innate immune system, is compromised. So that's what I was saying. That uh, HSV2 increase the acquisition of HIV. It also increase the levels of uh, HIV, so the HIV viral load both in locally, you know, in the genital area, but also in the plasma, the viral load will increase because since it allows HIV acquisition, then you will have uh, HIV replication. So the viral load will increase locally and also in the bloodstream, the patient will have a high viral load, you know. So as a result, it also increases then the possibility of HIV transmission because if the new victim is then in a protected sex or contact with uh, an HIV negative person, it's easy to transmit a, an infection at a very active uh, stage. But 
not only that HSV2 has an effect on HIV, HIV also has an effect on uh, a herpes simplex virus. So the effect of HIV on HSV2 is the same. The HIV alters the clinical presentation and the frequency of HSV2 shedding. Now remember that uh, HSV2 is, uh, I will do a lecture on specifically on uh, HSV2 as a sexually transmitted disease, you know, and the HSV2 um, gives you lesions, you know, on the genital area. And it gives you a chronic infection, even if it's asymptomatic, but asymptomatic people will keep shedding the virus and they can transmit the virus. Now, if that person is HIV infected, the frequency of shedding of the virus, of the HSV virus will increase, you know, so they will shed more of that virus and uh, they will be a uh, high risk for HSV2 transmission. And the other thing is that if HIV infected people develop HSV2 infection, actually the lesions, the clinical presentation of the lesion will be affected because those lesions will look uh, much more bigger or larger, or the lesion will be much more ulcerated, and, uh, and the frequency of the lesion will also, they will start appearing much more frequent, you know, because it's a chronic, it's a chronic condition. HSV2 is a chronic condition. So it will uh, reoccurring much more uh, frequently in HIV positive patient than as compared to the HIV negative patient. And uh, they will, we will then see a longer duration of the lesions, especially if uh, the patient CD4 count is below 200. You know, we will have uh, uh, the, the lesions, the ulcerative lesions will be persistent for a much more longer time. So, and the third thing is that the HIV will then increase also HSV2 acquisition and the transmission. And we can, we can see here how HIV then increase the risk of uh, HSV2 acquisition. It's because first it increased the occurrence of the primary HSV infection, and then it will then reduce the genital innate immunity. So the immune system locally at the genital area will drop. So HSV2 will then have uh, an opportunity to, uh, to occur. So we will have the reoccurrence of uh, that infection much more often. Okay, so the two diseases affect each other you know, by increasing the acquisition and transmission of the other infection. So that is the intersecting, the intersection among the two infection. Now, there is what we call a crosstalk between uh, HIV and uh, HSV2. So what happened is that uh, when someone becomes infected with uh, HIV, when you are infected with HIV, HIV will then infect your CD4 plus T cells. So it will destroy all your, your T cells. Your T cells are destroyed in that time as a result of an active HIV replication. Uh, most of your T cells are then uh, uh, destroyed. So not only that you will have a T cell depletion, but you also have activation. So at a peripheral systemic level, you have a T cell depletion, but then uh, you have activation because you need uh, more other T cells to come to try to control the infection. So most of those CD4 plus and CD8 plus cells will come and they will be more infected and destroyed by uh, HIV virus. So as a result, you will have uh, a, decrease, a decrease of the Th1 response. So the Th1 response that is a, a, an inflammatory, a pro-inflammatory response will go down. And uh, it has been shown that uh, it is because the Th1 response will go down, the Th2 response will go up, and uh, the HIV replication will continue more and more. And the result of the decrease in the Th1 response will result in HSV2 reactivation. Remember that the HSV2 is a chronic dormant infection. It will be dormant uh, in the nerves. 
and uh, it will be dormant, then because of the decrease of the immune response, you have HSV2 reactivation. So this is the crosstalk between uh, HSV2 and HIV. So it will reactivate and uh, that will lead to more T cell activation and more CD plus and CD8 uh, plus T cells will be attracted, so there will be more HIV. This will allow again more HIV replication, and the cycle will continue. So this is how HIV and HSV2 talk to each other, and uh, that's why the two infections will move together. So we have uh, many HIV positive patients who have uh, HSV2 reactivation. So um, how does the pathogenesis, let's look at a bit the pathogenesis of uh, HSV2 infection. So what happened is that uh, first, when you come into contact with the virus, with HSV2, herpes simplex virus, you come into contact with it, and uh, it's either you have a broken uh, skin or epithelium, or on the mucosal surface of your genital area, you come into contact with uh, uh, HSV2 virus, then uh, there will be a initial local viral replication at the site of primary infection. Let's say this will happen here, you know, here that's on the skin, you have broken skin or mucosal surface, you have a primary replication of the virus here. Then following that, um, it's either an intact variant or it capsid is then uh, taken uh, it's transported in retrograde. It's taken in retrograde. It will follow these nerves. It's taken in retrograde, you know, until here in the spinal cord. In the spinal cord, uh, it's taken, so the virus is taken by the neuron until it will reach the dorsal root ganglia in the spinal cord. And that's where uh, you will have another replication, first another replication here. So you have uh, initial replication, you have another replication here. Then after that, the infection will be, will then remain dormant. It will be dormant at the, dom at the dorsal root ganglia, you know, of the neuron. So it will stay there. Now, if there is any factor like HIV, if that person has a dormant, infection. Now, when that person becomes infected with HIV or any other reason for uh, the immune system to go down, now you will have a reactivation of the infection. So this infection, that, this virus that was uh, dormant here will then reactivate and here at the surface the patient will develop vesicles, vesicles, and the vesicles will then be broken to have an ulcerative lesion. So here you can see, um, I just put this picture here on a patient with HSV1, although we are not really discussing HSV1 in this presentation, but HSV1 gives you mainly um, oral lesions that you see here, vesicles, you know. This is HSV1 infection, but HSV2 infection is a genital infection. So you have vesicles here. You have vesicles here that you can see. And after a few days, these vesicles will be broken like you can see here on this picture. They then start uh, giving a small uh, ulcerative painful lesions. They are really very painful ulcerative lesions. You know, you can see them. So it's a result of uh, activation, you know. And um, even when the patient, especially in female patient, even when they are asymptomatic, but they keep shedding the virus. And the duration um, of uh, those patients shedding the virus will increase if those patients are HIV infected, if they are HIV infected. And uh, in HIV positive version, we have seen also disseminated HSV2, HSV infection. You know, they can develop encephalitis, they can develop uh, so infection in the brain, they can develop infection in the eye, that we call keratitis, they develop uh, mucocutaneous lesions, they develop, uh, you know, uh, and we, we spoke about genital lesions, you know, so they can have. Uh, 
other disseminated, other infections as a result of uh, the reduction of their immune system. So um, how do we manage and prevent the occurrence of HSV2 in uh, HIV infected uh, patients? First, we need to know that HIV infected people have high rate of HSV2 infection and uh, HSV2 can occur up to uh, from 50 to 90%. From between 50 to 90% of HIV infected patients can develop HSV2 infection. 50 to 90 percent. So the prevalence of HSV2 is very high among HIV infected patients. And genital herpes in person with HIV infection, we say, can appear much more severe. You know, we can see the lesion can be much more severe uh, and chronic, as well as, you know, even if they are asymptomatic, the patient will keep shedding the virus. He can transmit the virus, even if he is asymptomatic, he can transmit the infection. Okay, now there are approved drugs that uh, belong to the family of nucleoside analogs. So they involve uh, what we commonly use is a cyclovir, but we also have uh, valacyclovir, we have famcyclovir, that are approved drugs that can be used either for treatment or for uh, as a preventive therapy, you know, for uh, prevent, preventing the occurrence of HSV2 in an uh, HIV-infected patient. Or, so they can decrease, those drugs are known to decrease the frequency uh, of the reactivation. They can decrease the severity of HSV2 infection or lesions. You know, so those drugs are effective, they are safe, they are well tolerated, you know, and... Uh, Although we're starting seeing some cases of uh, uh, HSV2 resistant to acyclovir, uh, but they are not yet very common. Now we have also um, what we call, uh, we use uh, episodic and su suppressive treatment. So after managing those patients, we can put them on uh, what we call episodic treatment or suppressive treatment. So that kind of treatment is aimed at reducing, what I say, the severity of the disease, reducing the duration of the symptoms or shedding of the virus, you know, and um, uh, with the objective of preventing the transmission of uh, asymptomatic, of uh, people, even if they are asymptomatic, but we can prevent the transmission of HSV2, you know, to their uninfected partners because of this episodic or suppressive uh, therapy. So the suppressive treatment might, uh, can be intermittent or continuous. So you can give it after a period, you stop, then you can uh, uh, keep it a, a, an interval of time free of treatment, then you can reintroduce it. So it can be intermittent. Uh -huh. You know, or it can be continuous depending on uh, uh, the clinical presentation of, uh, of the patient, depending on the clinical presentation of the patient. Now, um, um, so this is, those are the treatment options for uh, first line uh, episodic uh, treatment. You know, 